Hello and welcome to this podcast series brought to you by Connect Health Tech. Connect Health Tech is Cambridge University's Enterprise Zone, the gateway into the university's life sciences and health tech community for collaborators, companies and investors. We work to join the dots between medicine and technology across the Cambridge ecosystem and beyond by strengthening interdisciplinary bridges between academia, industry and healthcare, we facilitate real-world possibilities, transforming innovative ideas into tangible outcomes that benefit society. I'm Paula Rogers-Brown, Business Community Manager for Connect Health Tech, and in this episode, we explore the theme of building relationships and networking. Joining me today is Michael Salarco. Michael is the Investment Director at Start Codon, a life sciences venture capital fund and venture builder. Michael has broad scientific and commercial expertise and a strong passion for facilitating entrepreneurship. Prior to joining Start Codon, he worked for Cancer Research UK, where he focused on identifying, developing and seed investing in next generation oncology spin-out opportunities. Michael has a PhD in molecular virology and molecular toxicology, an MBA focused on finance and entrepreneurship, and is a certified licensing professional. In addition to his busy role, Michael is an active mentor with Enterprise Tech Star at Cambridge Judge Business School and Research England's MedTech Super Connector, and also volunteers as a STEM ambassador across schools in London. Michael, tell me a little bit about you. How did you start your career journey? Yeah, um, I basically was just always fascinated and passionate about, you know, science from a young age. Um, ultimately, um, like biology, chemistry, couldn't choose between them both. So ended up doing a biochemistry degree. Um, loved that. Um, still felt there was a lot more that I wanted to learn. So went on to do a PhD um, looking at, you know, molecular toxicology, molecular virology. But ultimately, I became fascinated by um, an emerging theme at the time of how cells die and the way cells can die in a programmed way, in a coordinated way, and how that could lead to a range of diseases such as cancer. Fortunately, you know, like many others, I, you know, lost a relative to cancer, my auntie, breast cancer. I want to understand why it's such a difficult thing. So I undertook work in that side and that, you know, enabled me to look at, you know, how cells die but also um, the immunological um, pathways on that ended up um, then saying I still want to learn more Um, so doing a postdoc looking at um, the cancer but the immune system I was also fascinated by how does your immune system play in cancer and you know how can it you know protect you from that luckily at the the times mid-2000s this was an area that was still untrodden Um, you know people were sort of shying away from looking at immune system and creating therapies uh, around that because they thought it could be problematic Um, there a good time that's now you know boomed and uh, and blossomed um, but great to see it at that early stage and then I felt well there's still more to learn here you know around the drug discovery side of things so I went on to work in drug discovery um, for CIUK so leading biology on early stage opportunities um, you know working hand in hand with um, in partnerships with pharma companies and also biotech companies that so, um, had that insight as well as time went on, even though I loved the lab, I started to um, see, you know, working with the business arms of organisations, I really enjoyed that. Um, I then subsequently moved into the business development arm um, at CIUK, working on a whole range of um, deals and negotiations. Again, big pharma, early stage mm-hmm. biotechs. But at that stage, it was um, we did a lot with trying to get um, VC-backed biotechs. So um, companies that had uh, quite a bit in the bank, but still they had pipeline and um, you know platform companies, whereby they couldn't take all of them to clinic. And what we would do through CIUK is take these opportunities through to the clinic and negotiate those deals up front. And so I got to get a really good appreciation of what made up a VC backable company and, you know, how your charities like CAK could help. That led on to, you know, moving more into the seed investment arm of CIK, which newly started and using the knowledge I'd gained from working with VC-backed um, biotechs. But I was always keen on entrepreneurship and um, I started to think about ways we could promote that within the CIK environment. I managed to um, you know, speak to the powers that be at CIK um, to support me on this. And in that time, um, we started a number of entrepreneurial initiatives at CIK. Now, ultimately, um, 
put a start code and who was just starting. This was um, sort of summer 2019 on the radar. Um, and then I had a chance to start working with them on secondment uh, and then ultimately and, and never left. Um, <laughs> came over full time in February 2021. And um, yeah, and that was that. It sounds absolutely fascinating. So, so what does an average day look like in your current role? Yeah, you know, um, no day is, they always say is the same. Um, but in general, it, it could start with, you know, calls um, maybe from about 8 a.m. Um, if I've got calls with Asia, um, with opportunities there. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, on large, if it's UK, Europe, continental Europe, it'd be about calls from nine o'clock. And these will be generally with founders. So, you know, early stage companies could be established companies and founders, you know, pitching um, to me. Um, um, you know, using such um, Zoom or Teams, the you know the usual, and um, trying to um, bottom out, you know, what the, the opportunity they may have. Often they've got an idea um, through their deck, but I, I start to I'm listening to that, but I'm also trying to see the bigger piece because the narrative is you know the the key thing here. And sometimes you know, as founders, they they may have their sort of general path they want to go but it could be actually a bigger space here and so have a, a good discussion on that that will go back to back um you know throughout the day um and then it's a case of fit maybe finish about six of you know all of those calls um and then it's really doing the, the real work writing up notes some memos thinking about you know ultimate um upcoming pitches that are going to take place other you know events that i'm going to be you know at i'm on a number of judging panels um you know pitching competitions the like and doing driving down that we have a, a whole range of investment docs that need to be written up so i tend to do the the written part of my work in the evening six till maybe about nine o'clock um, and then the, the sort of the calls in between there you know now things are opening up i'm doing back out again on the road um you know meeting the founders face to face uh, meeting academics because we you know do a lot of venture building and spinning out companies from institutions and they're, they're you know great the um the good thing is that um, you know whether it's virtual or face to face you can still build up a, a good rapport on that um, what we also do is on any given day we always set aside time to speak to our portfolio companies companies we've already invested in and that's great um, because we we already sort of map out you know what should have been done in the past week and what we're going to plan to do in the next week and there may be you know tasks for ourselves uh, the investors or tasks for you know the founders to to do and we help them on all aspects of commercial R&D experimental ideas you name it on that. What are the common myths about your area of work investing because it's something that um, I would say become more accessible so what are the common myths that you can debunk for us here today? Yeah, I think um, one common myth may be that, you know, investors are just there to, you know, shoot down and reject opportunities in effect. It's just, you know, no, no, no. But, you know, the investors that we always deal with, um, you know, across the board and, and ourselves, we're all about ultimately giving back um, and that's you know giving back advice there may be opportunities that you you know you review that may not fit an investment thesis but you're always trying to find a way to help you know partners so i think that's one thing all investors there are more about listening to an opportunity and then trying to give advice to make it better and also act collaboratively i think that, that's that second part where generally people always think and you know feel that investors are just out for that one gem and they're not going to share it with anyone else but actually investors are highly highly collaborative i mean we're always you know sharing deal flow you've got a non-confidential and data pattern that's coming from one side you know happy to pass it on with permission from the founders to to other investors to introduce them to other investors and the like maybe you syndicate so you invest on a, on a deal together but highly collaborative and we're, we're not about, you know, just grabbing power and grabbing all of that. So I think those are two points that are definitely misconceptions. Fantastic. Lovely. Now, in a recent report by the um, Bio Industry Association and Clarivate, um, in their report, it showed that 2021 was the highest year on record for investments in UK life science companies and biotech. So 4.5 billion was secured in private and public financing. 2 billion more than in 2020. And this is just in the UK. 
what can you tell me about this increasing trend for investment in the UK life science sector? And what are some of the key drivers you're currently seeing? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, what, what's really exciting about UK life science scene, um, and this was happening before, um, you know, the, the pandemic, but it's definitely, you know, grown um, since. Um, and, you know, you can almost see with like Moderna, BioNTech, Vaxitech, you know, these are biotech companies that, you know, made such a massive difference. And it really shone a light to the whole world on the power of biotech and not just, you know, the great work that pharma does, but, you know, smaller companies that they can really do um, exciting work. So before this was even, you know, coming in, we were speaking to, I'd say, pure paid pure play tech investors who were you know interested in the the life sciences space and they were interested in it um, mainly because they could see we get to this point which is now termed tech bio but more of these data driven opportunities and that's you know come about because you, you've got more genomics there's more big data there and that's been driven because you know drug companies have realized that personalization is important. The best way you can start to personalize your drugs is to understand more about the makeup of the person. You can do that from genomics, you know, single cell sequencing, you name it. And genomics is getting cheaper. And so you're aggregating all of that data from all these um, data sources. And so pure play tech investors start to say, well, you know, we can use our knowledge from the tech side and we can help on a healthcare side, especially, you know, given um, certain investors their limited partner mandates to you know do you know do more good in the world you can't do you know anything better than trying to maximize patient benefit so what we're seeing is you know more money coming in but a lot of that money not just from the, the life science investment side but actually pure play tech investors moving into the market because they see they can you know add value to it and bring in you know more um, multidisciplinary approaches with more machine learning and computational um, barges coming up um, and they understand that side so it's not a case of just learning about you know chemistry biology and you know and areas there but it's actually bringing their tech knowledge and how they build you know platform stacks on that side to a more healthcare life sciences side plus the, the capital as well so it's I can see it only growing in this space yeah and it sounds like it's sort of changing the landscape a bit there um you know you you've mentioned a, a few times pure play tech um and uh, investors and that's that's an interesting I've not heard that term before and it really sounds like with computational biology, um, data scientists, we're really starting to see a, a shift in the, in, the, in the landscape there of the type of skills and talent um, and interest that there is within the life sciences sector. Is that something that um, you, you would say has been, is, is going to continue to grow? Yeah, no, I definitely do. I, I think people realize, you know, scientists, uh, you, you're doing research, be a PhD or the like, you'd always be somewhat focused and channeled on that area um, you know maybe not looking outside of, of that area I think that multidisciplinary approach just in basic academic research and now which is growing into you know companies as well is is here to stay people are realizing that you know you may be a biologist but you may not be um, a, a data um, expert or machine learning expert and you need to collaborate or bring in that now you're starting to have companies that are growing where you've got multidisciplinary teams that you know set these companies up for success um, by taking in all of this information and enabling the companies to, to scale better and do more so I definitely think you know you're getting more of a crossover of say physicists into you know companies that may have just been a, a chemistry only play but they're bringing their knowledge to say you know how can we use mathematics and you know and quantum um, thoughts on this and, and that's really exciting to see. It is it is very exciting so, so tell me, Michael, what initial advice would you give to someone who wishes to take their research to the next level um, and develop that proof of concept and maybe create a spin out venture? I'd always say that, you know, um, people should reach out. Yeah, so get on LinkedIn, you know, 
get on Twitter, get on social media and, and just, you know, ask for a call. Find find people that have already you know, done it, early stage founders, um, some that have been successful, even, you know, um, business development um, um, people, people with commercial background, industry leaders, just reach out and ask them for, you know, just a bit of time. What would be amazing surprise is that people have always got time, are happy to jump on the call for, uh, you know, a, a bit and just, you know, give back, give some some advice you know often they you don't want people to you know make the same mistakes that they may have had to do and this is a a, a growing area you, you think um yes the we've in the UK got really exciting companies and really great companies have been started but there's still more that could be done and I'd say you go back 10 20 years and entrepreneurship wasn't really on an academic's mind now it's definitely um you know front and um center of you know an opportunity they could go into and there are more people doing it and thus there's more information out there so i'd always say you know and urge um, people that are thinking about an early stage venture is to reach out you know to people there um and and go to um you know reach out to investors like ourselves at start code or not others because they'll always be you know happy to help and give advice about that investment side how you can set potentially your company up for success but also introduce you to other people that could help because that's always the key you know you get that network right you start to meet others in that they give more advice and you you know you're you're in the market in effect Yes, it sounds really simple, but taking research to the next stage can be a really quite daunting prospect and platforms like Connect Health Tech can really help in this area. As a community, we have such a wealth of knowledge and expertise, including the university's knowledge exchange connectors and technology transfer specialists. So, yeah, that's a, it's a really great, great point there to make in reaching out and just asking a question and having that, that, that initial conversation, as you said, Michael. And this leads me on because you've talked about network and relationships um, touched upon that already. So what would you say are the key components for building um, a, a meaningful relationship? You know, can you break that down for our audience? What, what you consider to be the key components? Yeah, I'd say, you know, one thing that's really important, um, you know, to, to maximise good relationship building is, you know, having, being honest, you know, um, ultimately you, you're going into um, a, a partnership and you want to make sure that both sides are honest, you know, has it, that both sides have integrity. So I think th that's really important. I think what's being humble you know, uh, when you're going into a relationship as well. Often, you know, we may be a sector expert in one space, but we, we don't know everything. Um, and, and maybe that partner could support and help out on the, the stuff you don't know. So coming in and being, you know, humble and honest and having humility about things you don't know would be important. I think also being genuine is, uh, you know, a, a key thing here. Um, ultimately, you meet people, you can almost sniff out, you know, whether someone's sincere <laughs> and, and the like. And that it sort of goes to building trust. So, you know, um, lay your cards on the table, you know, be honest about why you're engaging, what you, you know, you want out of um, someone and, and also what you can give back. Yeah, really, really great advice there. Being honest, being humble and genuine and, um, you know, build that trust and build those trust levels. So do you have an example that you would be happy to share, Michael, about a time when a specific relationship or connection led to a successful outcome in your career? Yeah, I'll say I haven't got one so much for the career, but think about it. It was an interesting one where I am. Um, yeah, going out to events, you know, always actually meeting people and trying to support um, early stage companies. Uh, I met founders uh, several years ago um, at an event. Again, just give, they asked me questions, just giving them some advice and gave them my card. Um, and then maybe a year ago, they reached out to me uh, some, for some more advice and you know, started working with them, helping them out. You just don't, you know, on the side. And what we found was that, um, you know, really, we really liked each other, really enjoyed that interaction. And I realized that, you know, some advice 
I was providing, I could actually try and help them even more. Um, so in, in terms of investing in them and ultimately we managed to, you know, invest in this company that's you now doing extremely well. Um, um, it's about to um, you know, close a really big raise and in effect it came from it was unexpected that it would lead um, you know to this way but it literally came from just helping out um, you know uh, and not um, going into uh, any discussions with any ideas of you know gaining from it and I, I think that's one thing uh, I, I always you know try and do but it's one thing that people should always know you know you do things because you like it um, maybe not f to try and get some upside for yourself and you know maybe some upside could come um, when you don't at least expect it. Are there any other steps to building really strong meaningful business relationships for those early career researchers out there? Yeah I think um, we touched on you know reaching out is key and you know LinkedIn maybe Twitter um, can can help on that. I think as, as you say as we're emerging now that you know people want to see each other face to face and i i think they're you know simple things like um the initiatives um you know like such as pitching a pint um you know going out to these competitions going out to listen to pitches going out to these entrepreneurial say life science and healthcare ecosystems um that you know many of them are free and, and just meeting people in in that and just understanding what what's the, the state of play in terms of you know um, companies growing in terms of investment who you should speak to a lot of at a lot of these you know um events and, and competitions you have a whole range of people so you have industry leaders you have your founders you have your investors and i think now we're emerging and we're, we're you know able to get out there i think being out there and speaking to people and understanding the lay of the land now in this post pandemic well, you know so to speak um era would be important um as well as as i say you know just catching up with people more targeted via LinkedIn who would always have time to jump on a short call. What advice would you give to an entrepreneur whose key business relationship is not working out as expected? So they've done everything that they needed to do. They've done the bootstrapping, they've made prototypes, gained further investment and sought support in all the right places that you would expect, but the partnership or investor relationship is not working out and they turn to you. What do you say to them, Michael? I would say, you know, it comes back to always being honest and, and thinking about that. I, I would suggest they have a frank and honest discussion with the partner or investor, you know, just to gain critical feedback. Uh, there's no point, um, you know, when you feel the relationship isn't going well and you skirt around it, it's better to get to the nub of the, the, the situation. And then I would say, you know, armed with that information, go out to, you know, people that maybe closer to you and you know talk to them about this feedback that they've just received and see you know in an open honest way if it's valid um you know and whether you can yeah. change things that that's the the key it's, it's better not to remain ignorant if you know your your friends or people that are closer to you see it know how you are and have sort of just let it go um let them see it and see if you can change you know style approach what you know whatever and then go back to that partner and say you know look if it's possible you know i'm going to change in these aspects let's still see if we can you know work it out you know if we can't ultimately then you know it may be better for the, the good of you know the, the partnership to you know um, cut ties but ultimately it's better you're 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 more informed um, rather than you know taking a gun hole approach yeah and i i suppose from an investment perspective um it can be i, I imagine it can be quite difficult at times when you're working with um early stage founders um, and they've, they they believe that they're in the area they want to be in. But as an investor, you can say, oh, do you know what? I could see this working in another area, maybe another sector, perhaps. How do you go about those those conversations in, in giving guidance and steerage on, you know, this might not be the best, best approach for you, which is why it's not working out. You know, what, what do you how do you approach that? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. Uh, I think, um, you know, 
way you do it is, is you you take it sensitively. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, founders, their companies, it's their baby. Yeah. They, you know, potentially gone out and done their own, you know, um, landscape and market research uh, on an area, and they believe that's the the right way to go. What you do as investors, of course, you do your own landscaping and market research. Often as investors, you can get access to, um, you know, real senior decision makers, maybe sometimes um, key opinion leaders that the founders can't get access to. And what you've got to do, in effect, is come armed with that information. Um, of course, you, you can keep it, you know, maintain confidentiality, but you can say, look, you know, you've, you've got this narrative and this is your path. And of course, you've been in, you know, been thinking about this, working on it for years years and you've got information we've also gone out and you know we've spoken to a number of key people here maybe from industry maybe you know from pharma you know biotech whatever maybe later stage investors because ultimately if you're, you're starting in um, a company you've always got to be mindful of what other later stage investors will think about an opportunity as well and you say look we believe you know based on all of this information that this other path which may be connected maybe adjacent or not um may be the better route to go down but we want to get your thoughts on it so the key thing is never to impose you know on a founder it's just have a discussion but being honest great advice thank you for that michael and um, so let's talk a little bit more about networking what advice would you give to an early career researcher about building their networks? Are there any key factors or key steps that you have used in your in the course of your career that you think these are the top three or five things that I always do that you could give as advice? Yeah, uh, I think um, one thing with, with networking is just being you know, honest about yourselves and how you are as a as a networker. You know, some people aren't. Um, you know, maybe more introverted um, yeah, rather than extrovert and stuff. Mm -hmm. Being not being honest about that, but ultimately saying what is it that you you want to do? You you want to build. You know, your your brand, your your company. You know, gain some knowledge, um, build some more awareness. You ultimately think, well, if I need to do that, I need to get connected. And then it's a case of thinking about what the routes you can do now. And of course, during a pandemic, the, the obvious way was to use, you know, social, um, such as LinkedIn and other, you know, platforms we've also discussed. Now we're emerging from that. The key points now is, you know, where are these events taking place? Um, how can I get an in to those places? And often it's just, you know, um, signing up on Eventbrite or, you know, reaching out to, to someone. Um, on that, but I think it's the case now is to to be at these places um, and you know have discussions, listen to you know pitches by founders and speak to other founders and say you know really interesting pitch. I've seen how you've you know you've grown. Um, um, can you have you got any advice for me? Just starting out, or you know I have I've, I'm I'm already um, there. I've already incorporated my company, but I want to know how to go to that next step. I want to know, you know, how you managed to source your investors. I want to know how you, you know, dealt with the commercial aspects. Um, you know, did you have to build that team out from the get-go? Just having those discussions with founders, um, you know, they, those founders may introduce you to, you know, other um, um, industry leaders or partners who could come on as a chair, as a non-executive director, who can just come on as an advisor or mentor, um, you know. But without you having and engaging in those, you know, those initial discussions, you won't get that reach to, you know, other potentially ritual bounty. No. Yeah. So I'm just going to give you a, a little a scenario here, Michael. So. Um, I'm this early career researcher. I've got a great um, project idea. I've been in the lab. I've developed prototypes. I'm at a networking event and I'm talking to people. I'm doing that reaching out. And somebody says, oh, actually, you know, you need to go and speak to that guy over there, Michael from Start Code On. Um, if I were to approach you at a networking event, what are the things that I need to have in my playbook to approach you? Should I have what what should I be prepared and ready to have if I was going to approach you so I'm not going to waste your time or mess it up for myself? Yeah, no, uh, I think, first of all, the, the key thing you can engage me or anyone is just know who, who we are and, um, you know, what we do. Um, ultimately, 
what any investor and casters are intrigued by is you know something different something novel so just say hi yeah be be you know personable um you could we'll always be happy to you know reciprocate um and, and just you know craft in a, a nice and digestible way why you're approaching you know myself or, or the person and um, what you're doing what you're working on um, uh, and why it's different why it's unique you're almost planting the seed in you know my head or another investor's mind as to you know the, the potential of your play but always thinking about you know coming across <laughs> again those points humble genuine and you know really calling out why you're engaging um, with myself or someone else doing that you know it means it leads to exchange of cards then you'd follow up you know with that and ideally what we'd you know want and i'll probably ask on that time is a non-confidential pitch deck just so i can get into it and, and understand it more so you almost had that elevator pitch um you know and how you're differentiated when you can see it in 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 a deck it makes it easier um but always do follow up My, myself i'm you know always good with trying to you know catch up with that that person either you know reach out to me on linkedin drop me a, an email i'll always remember who i've engaged with mm -hmm. um follow up with a you know a deck um we're all busy people so if you don't hear from us in a week definitely it's fine to you know um follow up again in a nice way um, because we'll always get back often we just get you know snowed on with, with other things yeah great advice there so know who you're talking to so do a bit of advice do a bit of research before you make yeah. the approach um really bring to the fore what your usp is what's novel about your idea or your project and be prepared to share a non-confidential pitch deck. Be humble and genuine and just make the make the um, approach. Fantastic advice there, Michael. Thank you very, very much. Um, now I'm just going to touch on a little bit about um, mentoring because you do a lot of mentoring, which must be really, really rewarding for you. What does mentoring mean to you and should more of us become mentors? Yeah, I would say for me personally, mentoring is all about giving back. Um, you know, I've I've gone through my career, you know, where every stage of it has been somewhat differentiated. And before I've you know, made that leap, I've tried to reach out, um, you know, to people that are already in that space and just getting general advice about it, you know, um, you know, how is it for them? How did they make the, you know, the move there? And they, you know, I've been fortunate enough to um, um, get that information from people. So I'm all about giving that back um, to, to others, you know, anytime someone reaches out to me, I'm always happy to jump on a call, um, you know, and, and say, you know, how it looks from my side um, and, you know, give back what when, when i'm um you know mentoring um people the mentees what i try and bring out is they may ask me a, a question about you know venture capital or investing uh landscape they may ask me about bd what i try and you know tease out from them is you know what do they actually want um to to do um, because they may not be aware of an area and and then think about how best they could get to what they want because you you know once you've understood where you you would like to go in terms of your career then you're more motivated to get there they may be in a in undertaking a, a career at the moment that you know it's okay but it just doesn't really um tick their box but what they're trying to do now is just scout around and find out what could do that i'll say yeah reach out and if i know anyone else in a particular field i'll be happy to connect them on that it, knowledge really is power on this and as you're trying to set yourself up to to go on that path then it would be a case of you know understanding just exactly what they want to do and then trying to map out path with them in terms of how they can get there fabulous that's great and i think um again just to mention here to our audience you know that's one of the, the powerful ways that connect health tech as an online community can help you know, help you navigate find um, somebody not just to collaborate with but if but to be a mentor you know that's one of the things that we can do with um within our community is help you find the right person that, that you can share knowledge um, with and um, and connect and possibly find the right person to mentor you through your research projects or, or whatever stage you're at with your work. Um, so that's really great, um, Michael. Who though has been your most 
important professional mentor who's been that one person that you says yeah yeah that they they you know provided the best mentorship why yeah i haven't actually got a you know one say professional mentor i've I've say fortunate enough to have people who've given up their time given me advice um over the years who i don't even think they've realized how sage their information (laughs) actually was um uh, but i've been you know extremely and ever so grateful to them I, i remember actually reaching out to, to to someone on on LinkedIn many years ago um, and she she's just based in the States and she gave me you know really great advice she'd moved over from um, drug discovery into more commercial side and we we, we had a talk for maybe two two hours <laughs> and she just literally gave up that time and her advice was absolutely golden I, I don't think she even realizes how important it was I've you could know, stayed in touch but I don't think just how important and crucial it was and uh, so I, I've been yeah fortunate enough to have people um, that have supported me you know giving me advice and that's why I always say you know implore people to just reach out um, reach out to people because they'd be amazed by you know, industry leaders um, people in um, you know big um, roles um, in the commercial space who they think, well, you know, they're, they're never going to have time for me, but you'll be amazed how much time they have. And we see it with the companies that we invest in. There's so many um, people that are happy to give back, to be mentors that, you know, are in our network who start code on um, and give up their time and, you know, help support our companies. So, yeah, just do it, reach out. Yeah, yeah that's that's great. But how do you... Um... How do you continue to learn to stay on top of things within your role now, Michael? Yeah, I think because I'm, you know, fortunate enough to get a chance on a daily basis to speak to, you know, key opinion leaders in a field. So speak to academics, um, professors um, working in an amazing field and them talking to me about their opportunities um, and why they think it's good. You know, you you really get that direct knowledge of, you know, what is state of the art in an area and you you just can't beat that. I'm also, you know, actively um, still reading publications uh, when you get the time, just digging in, um, you know, upskilling on that. Um, I, you know, go to prior to during the pandemic it was virtual conferences now things have opened up still now going out to competitions hearing about opportunities and then speaking to founders after that to to get a greater insight into that too and all of this information is massively important and and it helps so speaking to you know the founders digging into journal articles um you know going to conferences sitting on panels too um you know even whilst you're on the panels living to your other you know panel members as well and mm-hmm. hearing their their thoughts and, and their suggestions is, is always rich so the one thing i would say is yeah um you know always keep upskilling and, and learning and being open being that sponge to soak up yeah. Whatever knowledge and learning you can um, in, in whatever medium, whether it's online, using things like Connect Health Tech or LinkedIn or reading publications, just soaking up all of that, um, that good knowledge and expertise that's out there. Um, what areas of health technologies are you interested in at the moment? Yeah, I think for, for us, we are, we're re- really interested in, um, you know, health tech said um, digital health apps but um, digital health whereby you know it really tracks back to a clinical problem ultimately when you, you're thinking about digital health and, and let's say you're thinking about the app side of things it's always difficult to, to build a moat around that ultimately you know the barriers to entry can be quite low so you're always trying to think about something whereby you potentially is a product which could um, gain a lot of traction in the market be it, you know b2c even b2b um, whereby once you get enough people on to that platform well you know the data from that can help provide a better experience and then you know always as i say limp back to the clinic and in an ideal world maybe go down a, a regulated um you know route um so it can become some kind of device uh, which again builds out that mold so we're keen on that we're also keen on you know well we think like wearables but 
you can imagine, you know, all these smart watches and the like, you know, give you information on you know, your sleep patterns, give you heartbeat, you know, mm -hmm. monitoring and the like. But I think we're really only scratching the surface there. We're seeing, you know, opportunities um, whereby you have these devices on you, you know, checking a whole range of, you know, physical parameters in a passive way. Um, yeah. And I think that really is the, the, the future. Um, I know it's been banned about, but I think the technology is starting to really get there now. And I, I think the information you can find out about oneself to help their health before, you know, symptoms arise or the like is going to be the, the, the future. And I think that's going to help, you know, um, healthcare systems around the world, you know, um, manage things a lot better as well and insurers. What's been the most important skill you've developed in your career journey to date? Yeah, I think that it's a good question. I think maybe I'd, I'd say empathy. Um, and, yeah. you know, it, it comes from a point whereby I've always been, you know, had empathy and been empathetic. Um, you, you need that as a, a scientist, you know, you're, you're working as a PhD, postdoc, you, you may need support or help from, you know, someone else and understanding their time and being mindful of that. But I think as I grew through the sort of commercial aspects, um, you know, do more negotiations, um, both uh, you know, commercial negotiations, investment negotiations as well, trying to really understand things from the other person's side, you know, on deal, deal terms and see how they um, see things so that you can come to a common ground and get the deal done has been something that's really grown uh, for me. So I, I'd definitely say, you know, empathy. And I, I think when you start to build that side and, and grow that side, I would say, um, you know, of your character and of your nature, you, you start to find it helps in a whole manner of ways because you're just more respectful of, you know, another person's time. You're more respectful of, you know, the issues uh, and, and the challenges and the pressure that they may be, you know, under. And so, you you know, you work around that um, and which makes it easier for them. And hence, some of those questions earlier you said about partnerships and business relationships, because you're mindful of, you know, what they may be dealing with. Um, yeah, and it, it's almost reciprocated. They can see that you're yeah. aware of that, that it helps for a better and deeper um, business relationship as well. Uh, yeah, and it does really go back into that a point you made very early on in the conversation about being humble, being genuine, building trust. All of these factors, along with empathy, they are bedrocks of meaningful relationships, whether that's um, um, professionally or personally. Um, and that really does seeing things from another person's perspective um, it can you know, it can be a challenge in the in the workplace. But it's something we all should do um, because we don't always know the pressures that other people are under and what they're, they're working to. So, um, yeah, it's it's um, sound advice you're giving there, Michael. <laughs> Thank you for that. And just talking about the challenges and, and, sh and showing empathy, my goodness, there have been so many challenges brought about by the pandemic. Um, what has for you has been the most difficult challenge you've faced and, and how have you tackled it? Yeah, I think um, for me, the most um, sort of, I would say the most initial difficult challenge that I thought would be problematic was, you know, investing in companies um, when you haven't had a chance to directly meet the founders. So you've yeah. been doing all it, you know, untaking the interactions virtually, but ultimately what you'd ideally want to do is, you know, meet with the founders one to one, um, you know, in yeah. a space, face to face, and you, you you get a greater measure of the the person. Well, that was always my my thought, and uh, the reason behind that is because you you know you're meeting them multiple times, you you're starting to learn more about them. You you're not maybe just talking about the, the scientific parts or the commercial aspects. You're understanding more about their life and stuff. And there's always uh, I think maybe in my head deemed that it could be difficult. What what I've interestingly found is that we you know invested in a whole host of companies during the, the pandemic, and then when we got you know, recently the chance to actually meet some of these founders, it, it was no difference. There was no difference yeah, from yeah. The, the knowledge and that rapport um, and that, you know, confidence and conviction that we'd had in them from the, the virtual interactions to meeting them face to face. The only one thing you can't always see is how tall or small they are. Yeah. That's always <laughs> put in. But other than that, it's been fine. And what, what it's just shown is that, you know, you, you really can, um, you know, 
get the measure of people from you know virtual interactions and that it's a good thing so it enables us you know to to meet people further afield you don't have to be nearby if, you could, if they can't travel you can't travel you still you know can understand them you can still try and support them and you still have that conviction you know when you're making those investments which is a good thing I think it's just really the whole pandemic situation has forced us all to think in a different way because I agree with you. I would say that investing in a company virtually, what? Why would you do that? You know, um, but because it's because we're used to the traditional norms of meeting people, seeing the whites of the eyes, and really getting understanding that body language and so forth and so on. But the pandemic has forced us into this virtual world where everything's you know team Zoom etc. And you've got to make it work um, and you can make it work, as you've said, and you can get all the information and all this, all the little, um, the, it's the little subtext as well from it. It's not just the, 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 in the main interaction, but it's those little, little extras that you can get. And you can develop that in a virtual setting as well. Um, and the pandemic has really, I suppose, helped us yeah. to, to better understand <laughs> how we can get the most out of it. <laughs> No, oh, 100%, definitely. Um, so what or who inspires you, Michael? Yeah, good question. I, I would say, um, you know, my mother is actually someone who who inspires me. Um, you know, she's she's someone who grew up, um, you know, and single handedly looked after my, myself and my my sister um, and she never had the chance to, to go to university. But even with two young children, she upskilled by, you know, learning in the evenings. And I think she always instilled and, in, you know, myself and my sister, the fact that, you, you know, when things are bad or when you feel things are difficult it's never that difficult and you, you can always find a way um to, to work through it and you know other people will have it harder than yourselves and and so that that's something i've always taken on board uh, you know I've, I've seen how much you know how well she 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 did with with us and uh, it's inspired me just you know always to you know just keep going keep learning um you know keep upskilling and uh, and never be too down <laughs> about you know life or anything um or the challenges we're facing because people have had to battle um through things a lot you know harder than more difficult than we we may be facing even though at the time it may be you know prescient and and, and quite important and that you know ultimately is it's always for, for me it's always giving back because i know um you know where you know route i could have been if um things hadn't worked out um and i i just like to give back to to others so that they can maybe go on a, an easier path and, and do well oh, that's lovely she must be very very proud of you hope so <laughs> <laughs> um you mentioned earlier on in the conversation that you you read publications and and so forth to keep up with your the learning of and the lack of the landscape that you work in are there any particular publications or books or podcasts that you would recommend to our audience yeah um maybe a couple um it's interesting um i i yeah i love books um and um reading and often when i was you know doing long train journeys books were were great or, or, or flights um to here there and everywhere as i haven't you know during the pandemic haven't been often on trains or flying so much I, I have turned to podcasts actually and uh, a couple um, one I'd say that's really interesting is, is one that's more on a sort of uh, one that's um, more on the tech side of things but it's called Acquired um, and, it, and it, it talks about you know more on the IPOs of you know tech companies or m a around tech um companies but they go into the history of these you know companies and you, you these are companies you know big companies that we know now but it's interesting to see that understand the history of you know, and how these founders you know often came from little with different um you know ideas and stuff so that's good the, the other side i'll say that's interesting is um a podcast um called business wars by wondering um and this is where it, it talks about a whole range of you know companies and how they you know um aggressively try and get market share and you know which ones survive and the pathways they go and again i, I look at all this and i listen to this um just to try and put a 
you know, a framework around some of the companies that we're trying to develop, where they're going now, the kind of ideas and things they, they need to think about as well on that. But it's really interesting just to hear the journeys and the stories of, of all these companies. Great, great stuff. Thank you so much for those recommendations. That's brilliant. I am now going to move into the quick fire section. So straight off the top of your head, please, Michael. If you could be an animal, what would you be and why? I think I'd be a um a, a lion. The why around it is, you know, the lions, uh, you, you think of them being aggressive, they're, they're quite intelligent, looking after, you know, the, the, the pride. And I think I'm all, I'm always about, you know, looking after nurturing. Do well now. Answer. Like it. If you could time travel, where would you go and when? It's a good question. Um, I'd probably, I'd love to go to San Francisco um, in the, I'd say, late 60s, 70s. I think it was an interesting time then, um, you know, as is for, for a number of, um, sort of political reasons and the like, but yeah. things were starting to get better, improving, and I'd, I'd love to, you know, experience that. And uh, it was a time for change, definitely, uh, around that area. Like it, great answer. Is it better to be lucky or make your own luck? I I always think you make your own luck um, myself. I, I don't believe in being lucky ultimately <laughs> um, because you, you've got to go out there. You've got to be hustling. You've got to, you know, chart your own path. And so, yeah, for me personally, I don't believe in, in luck. That side, I think it's all about making your own luck. Good response. What music discovery or rediscovery have you made in the last 18 months because of the pandemic? Yeah, I, I, I'll say rediscovery uh, around um, an artist called Michael Kiwanuka, a fantastic artist. Um, I'd been listening to him for some time, his early work, and then I hadn't um, been listening to his more recent work. And then, yeah, during the pandemic, I started to, you know, um, I got wind of something, started to chase it, track it down, and it was, yeah, great really happy amazingly talented artist and i love music so um, yeah really lucky to to um come across his more recent work yeah he's a phenomenal artist fantastic well thank you so much we've now come to the end um it's been great talking to you today and and thank you so so much for being a guest on the joining the dots podcast thank you thank you paul